Carl Livingston, which I'll, who, I'll, who I will introduce in just a moment. And then next week is Sharon Spence Wilcox, and she's going to be talking about choosing civility, the movement to restore social skills. And I think this is going to be a really interesting conversation. So I hope you can make it to that. If you are interested in an issue and you would like to sponsor a talk, I am putting together the schedule for Richard Porter. And we love it when students are involved in the programs. Many students have done programs in the past, and they've been great. So I will do everything I can to assist you with that if that's something you're interested in. <laughs> and can I help you with your, do you want me I to put I'm it on the presentation? Is it again? Shall I put it on the presentation screen? I think it's ready. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Carl Livingston. He is a professor. He's my colleague extraordinaire and a professor of political science here at Seattle Center. <laughs> and he's going to be talking about uh, this development movement in Greater Black Seattle. So please welcome Dr. Livingston. Thank you so much, Kelly. I appreciate it. Or so much in the library staff. We have um, one of the best, uh, um, most uh, amazing uh, library uh, uh, set of really professors. I'd rather really call them professors because they teach all the time of uh, any community college uh, in the country. And so where are our library staff at? Why don't y'all just raise your hands that, for the library staff. Okay, just two. <laughs> okay. So we appreciate this. And uh, uh, let's go back to the board. And I have my comrades here, so good to see you and the rest of the day. And I'm going to, if I name names, I'm going to leave some people out and be in big trouble. So. Uh, some of the professors joining me in this will, will come in a little bit. I think they they know I'm involved in it, so they're like, it ain't gonna start on time. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, they're, they're gonna come roll in when they can, and uh, plus they have other commitments. I'm so proud to have them helping me on this, because they're already serving in their, their ways, you know, their, their wonderful ways, and yet they're taking time out to help with this. And then there are some students and uh, other 20, 30-somethings helping with this effort. Uh, people uh, like uh, Andre Sherman, am I saying mm -hmm. it right? Her, Andre. Okay, because when I saw the spelling, it was like Andre. <laughs> How do you pronounce it more formally? Andre. Uh, Andre? Andre. Okay, but just Andre Sherman. Yeah. That's cool. Right All right, so, uh, <clears throat> yeah, so he's one of the persons out there that I'm going to, as we get closer to really putting this thing uh, in motion. I, uh, and so what is the thing I'm talking about? Well, um, about uh, hmm, almost two years ago now, uh, I was uh, at Starbucks trying to get my grades done a day early to shock people because they know I'm one of the last ones. And uh, I couldn't do it. I got into Starbucks and this, this, this crazy, difficult to describe foreboding hit me that African Americans are in a deep uh, morass, M-O-R-A-S-S, -S, I think, you help me this that we're in a type of a cavern, we're in a troubled situation, because normally, this is in good times, we're the last hired and the first fired. We have studies to that effect. Is anybody familiar with those studies? We have studies out of New York and other places that show that an African American <coughs> without a criminal record is less likely to be hired than a white with a criminal record. You know, positive for the effect. <laughs> Think about that. Then when a recession comes, that group of us that is employed becomes the first fired and the last hire. So we suffer during downturns. 
and we just experienced a major downturn. This downturn could only be compared to, I'm talking about what happened in November and December. Uh, nice ringtone. <laughs> and so she's like, I can't wait for to hear my ringtone. I can't wait. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. This is why I just give complaint, harassing the students. <laughs> That's so she's like, you have to bear this to me. I'm so sorry. I'm so this is why I don't have any friends. I don't have any friends. <laughs> you know, just making everything a joke. But uh, this downturn could only be compared to what? What other downturn that we've had? The Great Depression. The Great Depression. We've actually called this recession the Great Recession. Huh? The Great Recession, right? One of us. They actually got two or three different names. Oh, some of my colleagues coming in. Jeffrey, Jeffrey, just give us a wave now. Oh, okay. I, I, gotta, I can't stay long. I got some ways I'll say I'll be yeah. a good pleasure. Um, yeah, to always you know, look out for it. It's good that you're doing positive stuff. And the uh, main thing is um, study hard. He's getting ready to get on his bicycle, obviously. Yeah. And he's getting ready to do his riding and everything. <laughs> so, uh, uh, Anyway, I was going to call him Lance Armstrong, but Lance is not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Lance is with the juice. <laughs> he is a non-juicer. He's all natural. He's all natural. He's all natural. You're welcome. You're welcome. All right. Uh, and so African Americans have really suffered in this. And man, I'm going to tell you all, I, I couldn't really describe what was happening to me. I was in a public place, and I just, I just, it was like I zoned out. And I looked at my phone. I just began staring at my phone. Don't go all afraid now, phone. I'm trying to do the prop thing. <coughs> and I started calling people all around this country. Professors that I knew. Uh, in Washington, D.C., I called Margaret Sims, Dr. Margaret Sims, at the Urban Institute. I called up to Harvard to talk to William Julius Wilson. I called for Professor uh, Glenn Lowry. I called local people up here. I called for Dr. Thad Spratlin. Some of the, I'm sorry, the Dr. Thad Spratlin, I did call for him too. He responded, I was trying to push him off. I called for William Bradford. I wanted the best minds to come together to describe the crisis African Americans are in, because I knew people wouldn't take my word for it. And most of them didn't call me back. And the worst of it was that I got to uh, DC in August, and I went out to see Margaret Sims personally because she was like, I'm too busy right now. And so here I have flown out there to take part in another conference. I walked all the way over to her office. I'm on the floor now. Ladies and gentlemen, Charles, no, sorry. See, that's what I get. See, that's why he don't like me. I'm telling you right. Why? Because that's why I made friends. Bothered people. And I went up to see Margaret Sims. She was in the office. And I said, I just want to talk to her just briefly. And the secretary came back and said, she's too busy to come out and, and me. I said, no, I just you know, shake her hand. Just make her. She's too busy. I said, she's too busy to come out here. I'm from Seattle. Well, I'm sorry. She said she's too But the local professors responded. Charles Jeffers. Dr. Thad Spratt. And uh, some of their names are right here, five. And I called them together because I, I, I figured they understood this situation enough and they could help me, um, they could help me put a crisis document together. We ended up over about a eight, nine month period uh, putting together something that we call a crisis. Uh, the need for immediate, an immediate response uh, to the economic housing and educational crisis in the greater black Seattle. It was called a crisis, a crisis. The need for an immediate response to the economic, the housing and educational crisis in greater black Seattle. I intend to take this to Tacoma, I want to put it on the road, and I'm hoping as many professors can join me and we'll do it together. I'm hoping to uh, launch a kind of a development center behind this that will house all these documents that we're coming up with and, and finding online and in other places, hard, uh, uh, you know, just uh, hard copy books and all of that. And the library, you can help me with anything you find on development. I, uh, you know, I'm trying to uh, have a go-to place and, um, 
And anything you all want to do to help me with this development center, I've already offered it to the prof uh, president of our school, but uh, so far he hasn't really, I don't think he quite sees the effectiveness of it. But I walk around with a, uh, with a uh, 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 hand truck sometimes. <laughs> Because I want people to know that heard it from the concept stage. <laughs> I'm not stopping. I'm not. So I have to. I have to. Uh, I have to get this done so I can relax and go to other things. So it's. So that's the center. It doesn't look like a center. It's just a hand truck with a lot of stuff on it. And I'll take it over there from there or to LA or wherever I'm having meetings with people. <laughs> just entering now is Dr. Thad Spratlin. And uh, the conversations I've had with Dr. Thad Spratt, but he is this gentleman right here. I always like to put his name up there first. Because if we got to write anything, nobody will write more, nobody will do more research than Dr. Thad Spratt. Nobody will do the hardest way than him. And, uh, and I appreciate that he brings the highest levels of scholarship and academic rigor to whatever we do so that it will be um, we will make arguments that can stand. And so I just wanted to honor him. And anytime you want for Dr. Jeffries to, to come in and say something. And in the meantime, you can just say hi to <laughs> Tell you what happened. I was bringing the professors together because I just wanted a paragraph. I told you we did a 37 page document. I just wanted a paragraph. We were going to stand to a press conference, and uh, then I heard a voice go, well, I, I, I really think that we're going to have to do articles, Dr. Thad Spratt. <laughs> and then he said, uh, I'll have mine ready in two weeks. He was not playing. And then after he produced a, 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 the article, he said, you know what? I don't think now, given the direction we've taken, that this is the most relevant article. I'm going to rewrite it. Do you know how much help that is? Mm. I'm going to rewrite it to make it even more applicable to where we're going with this. So I just uh, take my hat off to you and thank you so much for what you're doing for the community. And, words. and Minnie told me, Minnie told me, she said, you know what kind of style he is? <laughs> All right. So we produced the 37 page document. And then, uh, I was glad to allow these professors to go to the other things they're working on, take a break, the holidays had come up. And so uh, we got to the point now to figure out what to do with it. So phase one was to come up with a crisis document. Phase two is to bring that, bring the professors together. So that's all P's. Anybody that's had me in the classroom knows that I'm into alliteration. Just way too much. So the first phase was the professors. Second phase was the policy makers. Bring the document to the policymakers to try to get something like a stimulus. Give stimuli, stimuli to everybody else. Something like a stimulus to a community that is so often forgotten. I like what uh, Reverend Dr. Samuel Barry McKinney says. Let me go forward a little bit. Uh, Thad and many and all y'all, this is going to be so, you're so used to hearing this. Wait a minute, did I, did I skip it? Was that him? That's him. That's him. We're the last, the least, the lost, the left out, and the locked up, and I add the locked out. Like a little chihuahua, kind of, he's a big, you know, rupert, and I'm the locked out. You know, I'm trying to get in there. But, um, Rem Dr. Sam Barry McKinney, you guys know a part of a street is named after him on the 19th. And, uh, yeah, that says it. That says it. So who will speak for them? Who will advocate for them? Who will remember them? Must they always make their arguments alone? Last to be heard. So we're trying to amass a type of synergy in support of addressing part of us, the Seattleites too, who suffer the most in good times and really suffer. And in downtimes. Uh, it's said in the African American community that when the country gets a cold, we get pneumonia. pneumonia. <laughs> when the country gets cold, we get pneumonia. And uh, so that's that's what that's what's going on. And so that's how this movement launched. And so I went back to the professors uh, in 
uh, about April of 2014. And I said, professors, y'all gonna help me. I'm taking our document to the policymakers and I'm not getting much action. And I think we need a press conference, news conference, so that we can, we can give this thing away. And at the time, we had about seven props. And at this point, five of them responded, these uh, five uh, back here. And so that's what that news conference was all about. So we had the news conference. We held the news conference in May, uh, the 28th day, 2014. The mayor came and really made the difference. No television press showed up except for Seattle Central. And thank you, sir. I really appreciate it. Uh, the, uh, the television meeting didn't come. The stranger came and wrote an article on it. Uh, the, uh, it's not the Collegiate anymore, what's the name of our, City Circuit, Sorry. City Circuit did an article on it, and the Black Press, woo, don't leave out the Black Press, Lord, uh, because the Bennett's will let you know on the radio, <laughs> and so the Black Press showed up, the Medium did an article on it, so we got that, but, but the beautiful thing that happened is that the mayor showed up, and uh, the mayor said he was only going to stay about 20 minutes, the mayor stayed, and there were big things happening at the time. Really appreciate that. I uh, I think I had some misgivings when the mayor came into office. I didn't vote for the mayor. I told him. <laughs> uh, this mayor, in my opinion, is good. And I hope I'm not offending uh, the professors working with us on this. We were rather impressed, I think, that the mayor did say as long as he did. And when the mayor said what the mayor said, uh, which was this uh, statement in here, um, invite me back in a year <laughs> to report on the progress. You guys put down somewhere around the 28, 2015. <laughs> I got to give it to the professors so that we can find an ideal time because they may say, well, it's enough. It should be May. It should be April or something. And we're going to, you know, we kind of work these things out together. So, so it may not exactly be May, but we're going to uh, ask the, the mayor to come back. All right. That, when he said that, he offered it on his own. He volunteered it, didn't he? It, wasn't. it was wonderful. And that's like this mayor's first six months. This mayor, from an African-American perspective, uh, this mayor's been really good. He has given support to Africatown. And he did support, he gave support to the Africatown movement. Uh, the white king and some of the uh, younger people that are pushing. And Don Mason, a uh, former state legislator, has uh, pushed it too. He gave support to that even though they made the mistake of saying, and I think it was one of our former students that said, calling in the 911 when they were occupying the horse man building, called in and said, hey, don't have your police come by. Uh, you know, we got people walking around the building with a hair trigger and we don't want no problems. Exactly the wrong thing to say. And we said that. Uh, right before Mayor McGinn left, authorized the police to go in and storm the building, kick them out. They had occupied that building for about six months, I think, trying to have it become Africa Town's headquarters. Because they feel like, we, got a, we had a Chinatown, now it's an international district. And there are certain other things that are kind of ethnically focused that we have that are recognized by a city. <clears throat> Why couldn't we have something recognized by a city so that we can get some kind of uh, Institution, more institutional support to build the community. That's where they're coming from. They're using the research of Claude Anderson, a former math uh, professor, I think K-12, but just a thinker, and he's a thinker. He's written a number of books, one of which is Poweronomics, and there's actually now a Poweronomics movement. He comes from Detroit. Anybody heard of Claude Anderson before? Okay, and so Claude Anderson was the one that talked, talked up Africatown, this Poweronomics book. And uh, I don't know if you remember the first uh, Million Man March. Claude Anderson's movement was large enough that Farrakhan asked him to speak from the cities. And he's only done more since then. And uh, so Claude Anderson, a math teacher, is really pushing uh, private economics, small business investment development in the African American community since we got a capitalist country. 
as a mean, means to bring economic development. And so the Africatown people, he's, he's their main site. All right. Uh, the mayor didn't back away from it after that. I thought as a politician he would, but he didn't. And I guess he's given some support now. He's got to go to the city council of naming some of the streets. I don't know if they're going to do Martin Luther King up in the central area. I don't know if they're going to do 23rd in the central area. I don't know if they're going to do Union. I don't know if they're going to do all of them. As after town, they're going to start putting up banners and things like that. And there are talks in the way to get the after town movement, that fire station that's on 23rd and what? Yes, sir. Yes, So this is big. The mayor's talking about, if the mayor does that, now he's made provisional commitments, he gets that to the city council, he will have done more in whatever months he's done it than any African-American, I'm sorry, than any mayor that I know of for the African-American community. Because it just hasn't been that much done. The closest you're going to get, I think, is Mayor Rice. I'll say more on this in a little bit. With his reconciliation project. How many of y'all remember that? You know, how do you know all this stuff? Well, I went to Garfield, and, and I knew people oh. and knew people. And, Are you yeah. just part of the community? You yeah, I've been here all my life, yes. Yeah. You're part of the century. Yeah. Are you uh, uh, partly uh, African-American? No, no. Okay, but in culture, in culture, though, you know about the, you're yeah. part of the culture. Yes, I do a lot, yes. A lot. There you go. Okay, good. Glad you're here. Glad you're here. All right. Okay, so now, um, so now I want to give you this update, and let me kind of hit these PowerPoints, and then what I'll do is I'm going to try to stop at 35 after, so I'm going to try to race through the PowerPoint. You're just not going to be able to take enough notes. I'm going to try to race through. And then I'll give my colleagues a chance to say anything they want to say. Uh, Jeffries, you might have to leave before that, so if you want to say something, you say it now. Oh, okay. okay. So I'm not trying I'll to... I'll say something now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, it's really great to um, see, see folks turning out here um, in terms of um, folks, different ethnicities coming. I hope you're not just doing extra credit. <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot of my students are getting extra credit. You know, right? <laughs> I'm taking them any way I can get them. You know what I mean? That's okay, too. You know, in terms of my focus on the whole thing is this educational aspect. That's right. Uh, you know, it's like economically speaking, there's a direct relationship between the level of education and standard of living. And, you know, in terms of, of raising that standard of living, and particularly in the lower high schools and stuff, getting more of our kids in honors programs. Okay, and get you know, in terms of that's that's where um, that, that's where everything's at, you know, because Garfield has more national merit scholars than anybody in the state. Wow. Okay. They always have. That, or, yeah. Wow. Wow. They always have. Yeah. Okay. Well, ever since I right, a lot of people don't don't realize that you know national merit scholars, those people start scoring top highest scores on the PSAT. Okay. Uh, you know, when you hear Garfield, you don't hear that. You know, you're, you know, shootings and gang activity. And, and so, you know, the, the, everything's in place to where um, positive things can happen. Uh, right now, we just need more people like yourself, you know, who are conscientious, who want, who want to make a change. Because when one group of people go up, everybody goes up. You know, it's not just, well, we're just going to feel sorry for these people, you know, help them up, you know. But you're helping yourself in the long run. You know, that, that's one thing you always have to remember, because we're all interconnected. And I think some of the things are always missing there. You know, we're all interconnected. Okay, when, when Black people having problems, you guys have problems, you know what I'm saying? Uh, you know, and, and at some point, and, and most people who are racist, they don't like Asians anymore, they like black people. <laughs> you know what I'm yeah, saying? You know, so the thing is, you know, that, that's or the whole Jew, point, Jewish. you know. And that, that's why you, you have a vested interest um, in doing as much as you can uh, for the cause, because in the long run, you're helping yourself out. What's more important, you're helping your kids out. Yeah. Okay. Any right, questions, on, <laughs> any questions of Professor Jeffries before you? He's a bicyclist, and I, I, I didn't want to, I'm just glad he showed up. Anything they do for this movement, it just means so much because I know how busy they are. All right. Uh, reasons for the news conference, I already told you, you know, to, uh, to, uh, to take the uh, professor's work, declaring the crisis and calling for action, immediate response to address it, to take that and to begin to policy make, to come up with policy, Provide something like a stimulus, man, a big one, you know, that'll make a difference. I'm thinking at least two million that'll go straight to African American businesses. And then, of course, we had housing and educational things uh, that we were also calling for. And uh, um, and Jeffrey's mentioned some of the educational stuff. And uh, the details of the news conference we'll kind of get to in a little bit. I'll show you the agenda. And then the mayor made that great gesture. 
that was the uh, agenda. We tried to kind of let everybody say a little something. We had uh, one uh, council person. I, I was disappointed in my colleague, uh, Kishama Sawan. I expected, I wanted her to be there. If anybody has influence with her, I already told them I'm a little disappointed and I got no response. And um, I want her to be there. And I, I want uh, a good connection with Indian Americans and uh, concerned about what we're going through and not just what the poor are going through. Because sometimes we get left out when we address the poor. And uh, she didn't send anybody. And I went to the office about five times, mostly walking downtown. <laughs> Out of class. So if you know her and you're friends with her, would you let her know that I'm upset about that? And uh, you know, this is a big deal. You know, I'm putting everything I got into this thing. And so be here later this quarter. I intend to be there. And if I, something happens and I can't make it, she all said, you know, Professor Livingston is a little upset. Let her know about that. Uh, but I'm proud of her too. Though. Don't get me wrong, I'm so proud. I, I just didn't see it coming that she could win. Man, she just, her, her, her victory was amazing. So I give her credit for that. And I'm glad for what she is doing to help the working poor and, and the, uh, those that are struggling to make, to make it on, uh, you know, just the average worker's wage. Uh, Pamela Banks showed up with the uh, Urban League and uh, Willis, Ricky Willis, showed up with the, the Pastors uh, Association in Seattle, the Pastors Ministerial Alliance for King County. All right, just some disturbing facts and come back to those later. Here's a syllogism we were working with. Is there should be a space there. Uh, I just called it syllogism A. I guess there is a space there and uh, let me take it out of the presentation for me. A people's economic crisis results in educational disparities and shelter needs and vice versa. That's a major premise. A minor premise is black Seattleites are people in an economic crisis. And then what follows from that is that black Seattleites economic crisis has resulted in educational <laughs> disparities and shelter needs. You gotta put your phone on vibrate. And vice versa. So that's kind of one of the syllogisms we're coming from. All right, you gotta take a picture of that or anything. Oh, and if you guys want this PowerPoint, Somebody, if somebody could just pass a sheet of paper around, that would probably be more helpful. That and my writing my email down. If you send it to me, I can post it on yeah. the website. Oh, that is a much better idea. Because she's so responsible and good on email, and I'm terrible. <laughs> I mean, like they sit on salt, I'm terrible, I'm terrible. Yeah, I'm say terrible, terrible. Okay, here's syllogism B. Uh, Whenever any group's underemployment nears Great Depression levels, government must respond with strong stimulus or stimuli to that group's economic crisis. Note the Great Depression program. Note the Great Recession, TARPs 1 and 2. And other things done. So, so we have done this. Seattle area African Americans' underemployment is near Great Depression levels. There's something called the Race and Social Justice Initiative. Anybody ever heard of it in the city of Seattle? Yes. The Race and Social Justice Initiative did a, a report around 2006. No, no, I got to back it up. I guess that report's closer to about 2009 because it takes into account the Great Recession. And in it, they say that very thing that African-American underemployment is at Great Depression levels. So I think that helps provide a basis for this sentence. The conclusion is government must respond with strong stimulus. But did they do it? No. No. What I get is that African-Americans are just part of the lagging indicators. And you just don't know how much that hurts. It's like saying, we know they have special needs. We know they're going to be the last one coming out, but, but what can you do? And that just brings tears to my eyes because when it was the soldiers coming back home, even before they got into underemployment status, Obama came up with something for them. 
when it was the banks getting ready to, <laughs> when it was GM, Ford, and Cr when it was Boeing saying we might leave down south, and they still headed down there and parked them. We come up with something for them, but not why, why not? Why not African Americans suffering so uniquely? Maybe we don't care as much about them as we care about others. Maybe their pain is not like our pain. Maybe, um, maybe we just won't be that brother's keeper. All right, let's get that. That's a little bit more on them. Some facts to back it. There's McKinney's statement. Hey, how did I get to? What's happening? Is this thing out of order? Oh, that goes way at the end. All right, so let's go back up here. Okay. All right. So we had this meeting, and it was great, and the mayor was fantastic. And so then the mayor said, you're going to start meeting with my staff. And so we had three meetings so far, at least. First meeting we had with Deputy Mayor Ed Kim, Brian Surratt's office. And uh, they asked that tough question that I didn't want to address at the, at the news conference. That some of you left you students wondering, what are you going to do? Making you feel like, hey, you know, they called for a crisis, but they didn't have an answer. I couldn't at that time, we couldn't as professors come out with the answer because we already had people criticizing us every time we came up with an answer. We had the pastors criticizing us. We had the Urban League criticizing us, saying, why are you proposing a plan acting as if you've got the community support on the plan? You don't have that. Yeah, pretty much true. And the reason why is because whenever we make these meetings, people go, so what do you want to do? And I don't want to just sit there looking dumb. So I said, well, we could have a conference to garner a type of a stimulus and if we don't have the money with, in the government's coffers, why don't we get businesses to, to pony up money? They're already doing contracting. If they just shifted a little bit, 20 or 30 of them, towards African-American businesses that are falling. Do you guys know Catfish Corner just closed? Yeah. yeah. Do you guys know what kind of history Catfish yeah. Corner has in their hood? 60 plus years. Am I right about that? Who cares? And that it brings so many downturns. And now, gone. Jobs gone. That's the kind of thing we're talking about. And so, um, every time I would come up with just a proposal, a suggestion, I had the inertia from those that don't want to do anything, getting on the phone and calling others down to Urban League, calling the, the pastors and going, do you guys know Carl Lipster is acting in your name up here? Hmm. And I start learning new things about how things get done and how difficult it is to make change. Because there are a lot of people that don't want to do it because helping the African community is so difficult, so knobby, they feel like you're going to waste good money. And we don't have money. We don't have money to waste, for sure. So we got to start getting kicked back. And so, um, so it's been a big challenge. In the second meeting, they kind of shifted. First, hey, Kim took the lead. She's a wonderful person. She's a wonderful person, but they were all new at the time we first started. And they were trying to figure out, so what are you trying to do? What, what, do, you, what do you want us to do? And got us in that discussion of kind of outside of what professors do. As professors, what we were doing is making the case for the crisis. And just generally suggesting kind of what could be done, but we were trying not to offer specific solutions. We said, that's what you policymakers do. You're good at it. You're supposed to be served in Seattle. <laughs> part, they're part of Seattle. Some of it. This is what you do. And they were coming back to us saying, no, you give us ideas. That's how I saw it. And then when you give an idea, some of them running back. Had the worst problem. I'm just going to go ahead and say it. Had the worst problem with the Seattle Office of Economic Development. And uh, now you would think that the Office of Economic <coughs> Development I need economic development. <laughs> so I went to the office and uh, it was rough. Uh, they didn't even want me to meet with the director of it. The African Americans there said, no, you meet with us. I said, no, I, we don't generally just receive no's from people underneath the head and walk away. I got to meet with the head. 
Actually, you don't even have to help me meet with the head. I can meet with the head. But I'm I came to you out of respect because you're African Americans there. I'm really happy that you're there. Well, you meet with us and basically be telling you we can't do anything there and we will not declare a crisis. So you're the Office of Economic Development. If they're in crisis and you say something, it'll make the news and it'll make a difference. This is serious. Well, we're not going to go through all that and do all that. I didn't even know African American. See, I have one of my problems is that I get worked up. You know, there's something emotional about this because I think about the people that I know that are looking for jobs. And I got some homeless, uh, you know, I'm also a pastor too, right? I got homeless 20 year olds and stuff. Okay. So anyway, we had the third meeting, and in the third meeting, it was like we didn't have the second meeting, and I could see that they had picked a new person, and we, and Brian Surratt and the others were like, I don't know about whether or not we can do anything. So, I went to the mayor, uh, the mayor was speaking at another, he, had a, he called a press conference, a news conference for something he was doing, invited me as, with some others, or at least I found out about it, invited those from my group, and I showed up. And at the end, I came and said, hey, Mr. Mayor, I don't know if you know, but the whole thing that you said you, you were going to make some results on with this so wonderful, he said, it's pretty much dead in the water. He said, really? He said, well, why don't you contact my personal secretary and talk with me about what happened, which was wonderful. Right? So that happened in four days, five days. So we had a meeting with him. Told him what happened. Nothing's happened since then, but I was happy about that. The sense that I have is that we're just going to have to, I'm going to try to talk to the professors, not try to talk, sorry, I'm talking already with the professors, but just beginning that discussion, about doing something very specific, uh, a conference, that I was hoping that the policymakers would take the lead on. Inviting business leaders to the conference. And um, saying, hey, business leaders, as the city of Seattle, we're already looking at how we could do a better job contracting with communities that are still in the Great Recession. And we know we got I-200, so we're not trying to do this in any kind of a racist way or in favor or giving out any kind of um, preferences. We'll hit all the communities that are still in the recession. African American community is one. And so we're looking at what we're doing. We're going to shift some priorities over. You all, Boeing, Costco, the rest of you, could you do what we're doing? And we're going to try to hit businesses that got a track record. And we're going to work with local community groups. We have professors that said that where they can, they'll help. And we'll see if we can't hit them with a, a quick stimulus to, to help them out of the great recession. So I'm thinking about a two two or three day conference or something, maybe half days, invite some speakers down, they can explain this, people like Dr. Thad Spratlin, and uh, see if we couldn't do it. So that's kind of where it is. And uh, so now I'm gonna open up for questions. Uh, hopefully some of y'all can help. You know, there is a historic problem of an African American community. There's been some periods where it's been good, we can go through that stuff later. Uh, but it involves more than the mayor and here's some other offices, but when I go to these offices separately, none of them wants to do anything. They'll say, you've got to have a mayor's support. I'm like, but what about your, your office could already? Now you got to get the mayor's support. So then I'm back at the mayor again. And, but I'm just not going to stop, and we're not going to stop, and hopefully y'all can help too. Why is it like that? Maybe it's racism, intentional. Maybe it's in institutional racism. Maybe it's a sense that we just can't afford it. Maybe it's because blacks and certain other ethnic groups are just lagging indicators that you can't really help them very much. Uh, because they don't have, uh, maybe they don't have the infrastructure to help or all of that. Uh, what about the idea of waste and all? Maybe they don't have the intellectual capacity. Some people still have those views. And then you got Silas Potter and what just happened with the Seattle uh, Public School funding and that was all over the news. And you know, there was fraud in that program. I think he's doing jail time now. I'm a writer. Is it? Has he not been convicted yet? And I knew the guy. He was, but I had black contractors telling me, despite the fraud, we were getting more real work from the Seattle Public Schools than anything. When that dried up, that hurt some black contractors. And uh, some say we're waiting on the community to develop the infrastructure. We want to help it. 
but we think that they're socialist thinkers. They don't even want businesses. Like they're they're risk it first. So you got all these different reasons. What's the real reason? Maybe it's a combination. Probably is. And uh, so the annual meeting is going to come up. What's going to happen? We're going to be back on the road trying to do something to get their attention. And maybe you guys can help. Let me stop right there because I said I would stop at 35 after. And yeah. Okay. And, uh, 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 Dan, did you want to? Well, I just want to say just a couple of things in, in the way of compliments that, after all, this is happening in the heart of the city, yeah. on the campus of the Seattle Community College. And uh, it's not happening at the U. Mm -hmm. It's not happening at Seattle University uh, and any of the other places that you can name. So I just want to remind you of how important that is, how important Carl is in the effort that he's doing. And you can see how inertia, how not getting credit, how the people that are paid, paid to do their work in development and here somehow it's hard to bring them out, to put it on the line. But I think that what we're building and what we, the kind of response and interest and going from here, that, that we're, we're, we're going to make it. We're going to make it. Any questions of uh, Dr. Sprite? This is a big country. I wonder if you've seen other models similar to what you're proposing here any place else in this country. Well, yeah, in, 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 in another time, I mean, this process of grassroots, community-based development uh, I've been a part of doing all the way back to variations of, of model cities kind of program, or at a time when we had organizations. See, one of the problems there now is in infrastructure and organizations that we, we don't have. I just mentioned we don't have camp. I don't know whether some of you would, mm. would mention that. We, we don't have aspects of what the Urban League once was able to do and so on. So uh, we're coming in and saying, uh, look, we can count our losses, but we're saying, here's the way out. And we, we simply need the people who are paid to do this to step up, respond, and be supported. And so that, that's where we're going with it. So, so yeah, there are places and, and, uh, and activities that are, that are going on in other cities with economic development that we certainly would, would draw on. That's why, the, say, the Keno people, the policymakers, and, and the folks that we were going into that conference will be laying out what's, so this is doable. It's not rocket science. It's, it takes commitment, it takes an awareness and a willingness to cooperate and not to say, well, we can't do this because it didn't start here and we can't get the credit. And, and I've seen models with uh, Japan, with uh, Atlanta, and with uh, Miami. Uh, what happened in Japan, uh, as you get around 50, 51 or so, it was uh, um, the, the United States of America needed Japan to be economically successful in a capitalist way. And so they were kind of leaning on MacArthur to make sure that he stopped the communists there. But uh, they also thought, what else can we do? We need, we need them to be a model of economic success. So some of the armaments that we could have purchased uh, for ourselves, made ourselves and, and, and the government purchase, they decided to let the Japanese make, to provide them a type of economic stimulus as they were in the war recession, the war depression, and still trying to get some things together. They also did it in a uniquely Japanese way, which meant that they moved out of the way and allowed some of the old families that had made money back during the time of the emperor's uh, leadership in the, uh, in the war in a pro-German way, to let them come back and lead some things. And what did it do? It, 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 it helped provide a type of a stimulus. And the Japanese took it from there. Their MITI uh, developed their own uh, 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 strategic 
uh, 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 export-led growth, export-led industrialization ideas that are that making it in textbooks and economic, uh, political economic courses and economic courses of various type. The other example is um, uh, uh, Miami. When in uh, around uh, 1959, 1960, the lighter-skinned Cubans came over, who were making the money uh, over in Cuba, because of Fidel Castro, when they came in, they got some support from the United States of America to help them get into business uh, in and around Miami. And they took it from there. We wanted them to be economically successful because there were political uh, uh, and military gains from that that caused people to uh, miss uh, a more capitalist government over in Cuba. Now, same wasn't given to the mural boat lift people and the darker skinned Cubans that came over and some of those that they were labeled as having AIDS and labeled as being all criminals and all of that. But we did it for the first group that came over and they took it from there. They didn't need a lot of help. And thirdly, you have Mayor Ferguson, I think, and I get his name wrong. You, you may, you're going to have to help me, Doc. You're going to, and, and Doc, I'm going to come to you and let you say some things. Uh, but uh, Mayor, uh, is it Ferguson? I mix his name. Mayor, Mayor Jackson. I don't know why I call him. Mayor Ferguson, I think, is a, is a jazz player. <laughs> I think I messed up in my book as well as that. But Mayor, Mayor Jackson, an African American, when he was mayor, used all kind of government programming and things like that to, to redo the airport and other large projects and all, and he did it in a way that made sure that a lot of African Americans finally got contract. And what happened? An economic development, economic stimulus uh, in Atlanta. And they still look back fondly on those days in Atlanta and other African American communities. Uh, Dove, uh, just, I don't, you, you didn't see your name, but I had your name. Look, look right here. I got your name on there. <laughs> and so we're so glad that you're here. Um, and so uh, uh, Professor uh, Esther John, oh, I'm supposed to put Little Dove, earned the name Little Dove because of what she has done for peace, not just here, but really around the world. And so I was just so happy that she got involved in this. And so when I came down to do it, she had so many things going on. She said yes, and that also helped me with uh, Dr. Spratman, because uh, uh, Dad knew me, but he knew sometime I could be a little diff, 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 different. And I said, I got uh, uh, Esther, uh, little dub John. He said, oh, Esther. Go <laughs> back. <laughs> well, um, my, uh, my contribution to this effort is taking things from a psychological point of view. And social psychologically speaking, the implicit attitudes of Americans, and it doesn't even have to be white Americans, we've all learned to see black people as being bad or incompetent or unsavory, and we can't help it. We grew up in American society. And if you go online, you, you um, just Google IAT for implicit attitudes uh, test. You'll be able to take that test yourself and see to what extent you've been brainwashed by American culture, which has been spread all over the world now. So all over the world, when people see black people, they see, they, they fear us. And the other thing is that cultural competency is one of the most important basic skills that we can all have. And that, um, that includes the ability to um, see the other as ourselves and to empathize with what some people call the other and to really have a gut feeling that we are all in this together and to be able to understand that if they're sinking in the water in the middle of the Pacific Ocean because of global warming, that isn't something that doesn't affect us. We're all going to have the effects of global warming um, and climate change affecting us drastically in upcoming years. So I think it's really important for all of us to check our implicit attitudes and also to check our cultural competence and our empathy with the other. Quick questions of uh <laughs> Oh, sure. 
So I'm really interested in my psychological piece, but I, I, I get this feeling, or I, I hear this a lot, um, that Americans, uh, of course, they have their implicit assumption, but overwhelmingly, um, especially some young people, have this view that, that we should be colorblind, that Americans moved into a post-racial society. We have a black president, right, is what some people argue. And, and, and I think without examining uh, uh, the plight of the African American community, the lack of opportunity, the kind of the structural constraints on the African American community. So do you think that this kind of idea, this colorblind idea, uh, is really inhibiting uh, any kind of tangible economic development that's targeted at a vulnerable community? Thank you so very much for raising that, that question. It's an excellent question and an excellent issue because this idea of colorblindness, we are not colorblind, folks. <laughs> we're, we're centuries, perhaps, away from being colorblind. And there's a lot of work that's going to go into actually being able to treat each other as equals, no matter what our gender, our, our class, our um, sexual orientation, our ability status. And um, so the colorblindness thing does hurt us, because some people think that we're colorblind and therefore don't pay attention to the real problems that are happening based on race, class, gender, sexual identity, and ability. Um, I was thinking, like, how do you, because I'm really confused, like, what American culture is. <laughs> 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 yeah. um, like, what's the difference between American brainwashing and American culture? American brainwashing? <laughs> I can that word. You know, I, I would like you to talk more about that. I, I'm confused really about that. No, say more about your confusion. No, I mean, like, I, I come from India, and I'm really confused what is American culture. Yeah. I don't see like something American food, you know what I mean, or American dressing, mm -hmm. or American language, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's what well, I'm coming from India, you know what the English did to Indian culture, mm -hmm. and um, the way, well, and probably Indian culture had the gradation of colors and um, how people were uh, stat given status according to color, even before the English got there, but the English exploited the divisions between colors, the divisions between religions and social. And so it's, um, it's possibly a, a matter of um, being more politically savvy, too, about how these political divisions are being used to, um, to uh, hurt all of us and to make political um, social inequalities such that uh, people are not getting what we all deserve as human beings. We all deserve good education, a decent place to live, decent food to eat and access to it, clean water to drink, and not being drowned in the waters of global warming. So um, so I don't think I answered your question. I'd love to talk with you about it later, but um, that's my first attempt at answering that question. Thank you for raising it. And please allow me to introduce as well the uh, student assistant that's kind of helping me. And it, she'll, she'll be helping us. You're going to get stuff from Hannah Kim. And that's Hannah. Hannah, just wait, guys. So. <laughs> questions, questions of anybody? Questions? Yes? Um, going back to your examples of the economic stimulus. Yeah. Yeah, I know the folks, and I'm supporting them, but I'm concerned about it. Uh, they're really close now to getting some real, uh, uh, you know, jobs and, and, and stuff like that. And I want to make sure that it's the African American community. The latest things I've heard is uh, is that there's some questions about it. I'm getting that from Berlin and Jones, but I want you to know that I love the people that are involved in this effort. I have made some of the meetings and advocated on their behalf. Some of y'all got to go to class, and those that do, you can just go ahead and leave right now. And I thank you for coming so much. We appreciate you. Uh, what's the gentleman's name that uh, that uh, Asian American gentleman runs it? He's my friend. I think his name escapes me. Yeah, he's a great, he's a great person. Very fair. And there are a number of people around him that are good too. But I still watch it. Uh, 